Praise the Lord. God bless you. I'm, 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 I'm at home. I'm at home. I've been coming here for years. And um, these two people are family. So we're, we're at home this morning. And when you're at home, you treat it like you're at home. Um, it seems like the plane ride kind of magnified whatever was happening to her. So that plane ride just kind of magnified it. But God is still on the throne, isn't he? He's still on the throne. I'm going to ask you this morning, I'm going to share something with you that is near and dear to my heart because I think it is the voice of God for the hour. I think God is saying this to the entire body of Christ. There's sometimes God will give me a word, you know, just be for the local church. And then there are times God will give me a word and it's for the, the body. And many of you know I have the opportunity to speak in spheres that other people don't have the opportunity to speak in. God has graced me to be able to have my voice carry around the world. And, um, and so I don't take that as a light thing. I take it as a very serious thing. But I think you're going to find that what I'm saying to you, you can identify with as soon as we go through the text. Would you go with me to Luke chapter 18? Father, we thank you right now for your grace upon the word and upon our time. Holy Spirit, we need you to take what I'm going to say and communicate this to your people. Do it in such a way, God, that what I say and what they hear be one in the same. That there be no interruption and no interference in the airways. That the prince and power of the air be put down and that the people of God be exalted to the place where they hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. We thank you because you're the only one that can interpret the ancient text for us. We need your help this morning, and we solicit it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Luke chapter 18, verse 6 through 8. That is where we're going to start our text. We're going to jump into Acts 7, verses 54 through 60 at some point. But this is where we're going to launch from. And here is what I believe the Lord is saying to us in this hour. Would you say this with me? Will he find faith? Will he find faith? Will he find faith? Luke chapter 16, verses 6, one, I'm sorry, verses 1 through 8. 1 through 8. And he told them a parable to the effect that they ought always to pray and not lose heart. He said, in a certain city there was a judge who neither feared God nor respected man. And there was a widow in that city who kept coming to him and saying, give me justice against my adversary. For a while he refused. But afterward he said to himself, though I neither fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will give her justice so that she will not beat me down by her continual coming. And he said, and the Lord said, hear what the righteous judge says, and I will not give justice, I'm sorry, and, and, and will not God give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long over them? I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith? In the, on the earth. This is a parable told by Jesus of the persistent widow who pursued a judge who was irreligious. Several things we got to take out of this, we grab out of this text about the judge. Number one, he had no fear of God. He had no regard for people. And he represented secular power. 
But this widow was persistent. She broke the judge down with her persistence. She wanted justice against her adversary. And she was not settling for anything less. Here's what we can see woven into the parable. Here's a principle. Perseverance always outlasts persecution. Perseverance always outlasts persecution. Her persistence won. The judge decided to avenge her. Here's a takeaway. Here's a takeaway. If an insensitive, secular, irreligious judge would respond to a widow's continued request, God will certainly respond to the continued prayer of his saints. God shall certainly avenge his elect. God responds to the persecuted. Jesus knows, however, that persecution can weaken faithful people and cause some folks to surrender. They'll surrender their commitment to him. And what you're seeing in our culture today is people surrendering their commitment to him. So the addendum to the story here is this. Jesus says, nevertheless, would you say that with me? Nevertheless. nevertheless. The question being asked by Jesus then is the same question he's asking you and I today. Will believers, with all that has occurred, is occurring, will occur, Will we get distracted by all we see going on? Will our hearts shrink from fear of what we see in the world? Or will we continue looking for his return? Will you remain faithful? That's the question on the floor this morning. Persecution can cause hearts to shrink and give up. Enthusiasm to wane. I mean, you're seeing it now. What COVID did to the church enthusiasm waned. People became apathetic. They started making decisions that did not encourage their strength in the Lord. Jesus begins this parable by the most important part up front. He put the main thing in front. You will actually miss it if you're not a careful reader. He says, we should always pray and not lose heart. Can you say that with me? We should always pray and not lose heart. What's, be, what's being acknowledged here is the connection between prayer and faithfulness. There's something about prayer that keeps you in a place of faithfulness. People fall when they don't pray. People grow faithless when they don't pray. During COVID, we accelerated prayer at TC. We, we even inserted new times of prayer. Because one thing I understand about prayer is not something you just do. It's something you got to do. And I'm so grateful in this house. This is a praying house. The question being asked is about your confidence, your hope in him. Will he remain the object of your desire? Will he remain the object of your love? That's what he's asking here. Don't you think Jesus knew when he said this? And, and think about this. This is the way my mind works. Jesus is saying this over 2,000 years ago. But he's saying it relevant to you right now. Because he already saw what we're seeing today. He already knows what's going to happen tomorrow. He already knows what's going to happen next week if there is one. He's Alpha and Omega. Yeah. He's the beginning and the end. And he don't start something until he's finished with it. So he's looking at the span of time. Don't you think Jesus knew when he said this? We would be in the condition where we are today. The church would be where it is today. 
So there's some things he knows about his church and the heart of his church. He knew wars would be. He knew divisions of all kinds would be. He knew racial issues would be. He knew economic issues, political issues, unprecedented crime, greed, the decline of Protestantism, the transformation of languages to fit lifestyles. Them, they, she, he, pronouns. He knew that we would change words from being singular from one point to now being plural. (laughs) Body of Christ has been infused over the years with poor teaching about faith. And I'm sad to say, many of us bought the books and it became a part of our belief system. Well, let me help you this morning. There's a woman named Kate Bowler. For her doctoral dissertation, she did a study on what we know to be the Word of Faith movement, which can also transcend into the prosperity gospel. And Kate Bowler did an in-depth look years of research and talking and visiting churches and unpacking them. And her book is called Blessed. She understood the prosperity gospel, which has found its way into the body of Christ, is primarily me focused. What my faith can get me. Name it and what? Y'all, y'all know. <laughs> Bought the t shirts. If you increase your faith, you increase your wealth and your health. A lot of folks became disappointed because you realize everybody don't get healed. And that's a whole nother thing. But his grace is sufficient because it's made perfect in weakness. Everybody ain't getting healed. This is not at all what Jesus is talking about when he talks about this. Will he find faith? He's talking about God's will connected to your willingness. That's what he's talking about. That's what he's talking about. God's will connected to your willingness. God is looking. Would you read this with me? God is looking for our faith in him to grow more resistant to the circumstances. If you're taking notes, please write that down. Everything God is doing in your life right now is designed for you to be able to answer this question. Will he find faith in you? Will you be part of the faithful? Romans chapter 1 verse 17. In the gospel, there is a righteousness revealed from faith to faith. The just shall live by what? Faith. Faith. That split the church when Martin Luther nailed his 95 thesis to the church in in, in Germany and created such a a tear. But Protestantism, it was a protest against Catholicism and all of the stuff weaved in, indulgences and and all of the ideas and traditions. Martin says, no, the just shall live by what? Faith and faith alone. Meaning faith is at the beginning of salvation and faith is at the end of salvation. But there was faith demonstrated in the scriptures that caused Jesus to respond in a way he had never responded before. In the book of Acts chapter 7, there's a story of a man. The Bible says there were some seven chosen to be deacons. And they were the first deacons. And the, 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 the brethren had to make a choice. Spend time caring for this growing group of disciples or spend time in what God had called them to do, prayer and ministry of the word. So they needed help. But they didn't just pick anyone in the faith community. 
The people they picked had to have a good reputation and be full of the Holy Spirit. And here's an excerpt of a word about this man called Stephen. Verse 54, Acts chapter 7. Now when they heard these things, they were enraged. And they ground their teeth at him. But he, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God. And Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, behold, I see the heavens open. And the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and rushed together at him. And then they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their garments at, a, at the feet of a young man named Saul. And as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against him. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Hmm. Stephen led the group. But Stephen wasn't just anybody. Stephen was a man full of faith. It's worth noting there have always been faithful believers. Since God revealed himself to Abraham, faithful believers throughout. But there are some people whose faith just rises above others. There's some people who become, become people that people kind of focus on. Even in this church, you'll find some folks that you admire their faith. Stephen was that guy. Not much is known about his personal life, his parents, his siblings, or whether he had a wife or children. But what is known about him is that he did some great things, signs and wonders followed this man among the people. He was a man of tremendous faith and power. There were those who did not appreciate who he was. And they disputed with him. But they were no match for his wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. So they decided to falsely accuse Stephen, labeling him a blasphemer. And a blasphemer in that culture was a very serious crime. Very serious charge. And he was arrested. His enemies convinced the ruling elders of the community and the scribes. And they locked him up and brought him before the council, which is, would be considered our court. In Acts chapter 7 is the record of Stephen's testimony. I just read you the end of it. But Acts chapter 7, read it at your own leisure. It was the, the record of his testimony, which is perhaps the most detailed, concise record of Israel's history and their relationship with God in the scriptures. There's something vitally important to be learned about Stephen. Let's unpack Stephen. He was not concerned about his earthly existence. Did you hear what I said? His heart was toward heaven. His affection was set toward heaven. I'm going to say it again. His affection was set toward heaven. You move in the direction of your affection. You have the power to set your affection wherever you want it. You can withdraw your affection or you can release your affection. In human relationships, and I said this Friday night, distance is never measured in miles. It's measured in affection. You can have a husband and wife laying in bed together. When they're angry, they don't talk. They've withdrawn their affection and never shall the toes touch. Oh, you missed that one. <laughs> you know how our feet hit each other. Oh, I'm not touching you. <laughs> Some of y'all don't know. You, so you, you ha oh, you have not been to bed angry. Thank God. <laughs> don't let the sun go down upon your wrath. But there's something powerful about affection because Jesus said, Lord, I'm with you always, even to the end of the earth. 
That meant he would be near you always. Why? Because his affection would be directed toward you. So affection is a powerful thing. And Peter understood, Stephen understood this, and he was determined to stand firm on the side of Christ, no matter what the consequences were. It got pretty bad for this brother. And please understand this, what persecution will look like for the church coming. I wish I had the time to unpack this for you. But we're headed toward that. He accused the leadership of Israel for their failure to recognize Jesus, their Messiah, rejecting and murdering him. He accused them of a history of murdering prophets and faithful men throughout generations. Stephen's speech was an indictment against Israel and their failure as the chosen people of God who have been given the law and the holy things. He reminded them of their faithful patriarch Abraham and how God had led them from a pagan land into the land of Israel where he had made an eternal covenant with them. He's reminding them of all this stuff. It was their history being thrown in their face. He reminded them about Joseph's experience in Egypt and God's deliverance of Israel by Moses 400 years later. Throughout his testimony, he repeatedly reminded them of their continual rebellion and idolatry in spite of the mighty works of God right in front of them. I was telling Pastor the other day, we were talking. I said, can you imagine how depraved the human heart is? I mean, can you just picture this? You're asking God to deliver you. And he brings you through dry land, on dry land with the waters raised up beside you. And everybody gets to the other side. That would be all I need. Yes. I'm faithful for the rest of my life. Not get on the other side and forget what he did. But that just shows you something about humans. Yes. We forget his deliverance. We forget what he did for us. He accused them by using their own history to indict them, which really irritated them to the point they cut them off. They ain't want to hear it no more. You got to understand something. I need you to catch this. Whenever you speak truth to power, you better be ready for what power is going to say back to you. Are you hearing me? And some of us are real truth tellers. I'm one of them. I'm guilty. But you got to be ready for what power is going to say back to you. Stephen had already determined the consequences for his stand. He knew what it would cost him. You got to know what it's going to cost you to walk with Jesus. But he had a faith resistant to the circumstances and the consequences. This is a faith that is the remnant of God will demonstrate. The remnant, there's a church within a church, and guess what? It's being separated right now. Amen. Remember, he said the way is what? Narrow and few going to find it. There are those who are still standing on the values of the kingdom. There are those people standing on the non-negotiables of God's word. They are not for sale. Not to be compromised. Stephen is displaying the faith of the remnant of God. The true church. Jesus said, I will build what? My church. And the gates of hell won't prevail against it. I don't know if you got it here. We got something in America called progressive Christians. And they progress in their way right out of the Bible. <laughs> don't be caught Don't be caught up with all the winds, doctrines, blowing, all the new stuff you see. We got the word. 
We got the will. And I know the man you got here that stands in this platform. He don't play. He the same guy. He that guy. That's why I love him. Look like me. <laughs> when it's all said and done, they executed him. They stoned him. And look at the wisdom of God. Who's standing there watching? The man that will write three quarters of the New Testament. Ha, Sabrosa. God got people everywhere. They don't even know they're in position. <laughs> Boy, I tell you, I love God. I, don't, I go to sleep at night in peace. When it's all said and done, they executed him. Young man consenting with Saul, and we know Paul. But Stephen looked up and he saw two things. He saw the glory of God. And let me tell you what glory is. The glory word is doxa, D-O-X-A. Doxa means an image commanding respect. An image commanding respect. The same glory that every man has on him when they're connected to Jesus. So you don't have to fight for respect. Just look like Jesus. Number two, Jesus is standing at the right hand of God. He's standing. Everybody say standing. This is unprecedented in the scriptures. The question that inquiring minds like me ask, what caused Jesus to leave his seated position? That position is a position of authority. But then he stands. That, that, that turks me up. I want to know why. Why are you standing for this guy? <laughs> I believe he saw something connecting this man's willingness to God's will. He saw someone full of the Holy Spirit consumed with God. He saw faith that not only looked like his, but it spoke like his. I want you to know something. In verse 59, Stephen says, receive my spirit. What did Jesus say? Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. In verse 60, Stephen says, Lord, don't charge them with this sin. You know what Jesus said. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. His faith even sounded like the Father's. Not only did Jesus see faith that looked like his, he saw faith speaking like his. So I need to walk you through, because I, 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 I got to unpack stuff. I needed to understand the anatomy of this man's faith. What was it composed of? Number one, he had conviction. His faith was full of conviction. Conviction is a confidence rooted in courage. Do you know it takes courage to be a Christian? <laughs> There's an intellectual conviction toward what is to be believed. He had conviction about his faith. Number two, there was loyalty in his faith. Loyalty is like the roots of a tree. You know, the other day we had some trees cut down in my home because the roots were growing under the concrete and the concrete was raising up from the roots of the tree. So I had to kill the tree to kill the roots. That's some powerful stuff. You know, the scriptures uses words like root, rooted and grounded. Stephen had a non-negotiable allegiance to Jesus and his word. He had something that you couldn't pay for. He couldn't be bought. Amen. There's some folks that can't be bought, folks. I don't care what you do. They're not going to change. They're going to die the way they are. And that's a good thing. 
He had honesty in his faith. The core of character is honesty. Honesty is at the core of who you are. You are either honest or you ain't honest. It is also the core of faith. An uncompromising willingness to be honest at all costs. I told somebody the other day, I said, you are who you are in the dark. When ain't nobody looking. Shared some things with the men yesterday about pornography and how pervasive it is in the church and how we, the numbers, some 70% of leaders in our country are addicted to porn and they're leading churches. Kids as young as eight and six years old why? Because it's pervasive. Because we no longer have a problem with access. I got a, I got a triple X rated club right here in my hands. So we're talking about honesty. I share with the men. There are times when I'm doing research and some things will pop up on my screen. It'll be something pornographic. And notice how it is. You try to get rid of it, something else pops right back up. You try to get rid of it, another thing pops right back up. Why? Because they know human nature. About three pop-ups, you in. I had a pastor tell me, you know, when you buy a new computer, have communion. Get the bread and the drink and say, Father... I sanctify this thing. In the name of Jesus, I won't go nowhere. Like Job said, <laughs> he's talked about with, yeah, I, I esteem your word even greater than my own food. I'm going to commit my eyes to seeing only things you want me to see. Some non-negotiables. We're talking about honest, honesty. Honesty. That's what led him to speak truth to power. He was honest. With no regard for his physical well-being. He trusted God with that part. He, he trusted God with his body. Are y'all hearing me? Jesus said, in the name, fear not him who can destroy what? The body. Fear him who can cast both body and soul into hell. That's who you fear. Don't fear man. You got a hell or heaven to put you in or keep you out of. You fear God. And then the last part of his faith was trust. Everybody say trust. Trust, trust is this. Trust is the one transcendent value necessary for faith to exist. Trust provides a strategic advantage for anyone choosing to live by it. Everybody say trust. You can't have a relationship without trust. Trust is extended to the limit of truth and no more. The minute a lie enters, trust is broken. And you know how you rebuild trust? Consistent action over time. I got to be able to trust you again. And you can't complain about how long it's going to take. You don't have the right to tell me. You are responsible for rebuilding my trust. Hallelujah. I had a sister come to me one time. The man committed adultery. And she said, Pastor, he's sitting right there. She says, yeah. he says, I, don't forg I didn't forgive him. I said, well, what, what, what are you doing? She said, he's sleeping in another room. I said, so? The Bible says, be reconciled. That's immediate. It didn't say be restored. Restoration takes time. I got to be able to trust you to restore you. Oh, y'all looking at me like I ain't got two heads. 
We are called to reconcile immediately because we have the, 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 the spirit of reconciliation, the ministry of reconciliation. But reconcil restoration is about trust. Can I trust you again with the space I gave you in the first place? And so she was saying, he's sleeping on the couch, Pastor. I said, well, you're in the house. He said, she didn't forgive me. I said, but you're in the house. And you got a bed. She got a right to kick you out of the house. But you're in the house. Now work your way back to the bed. Work your way back to the bed. And you don't have the right to tell her when she should allow you back. Part of your coming back. Part of your coming back will demonstrate itself in your heart of repentance. Because, you know, Christians are good at remorse. They don't do repentance well. <laughs> and see, an apology, I'm sorry for going off on this tangent, but an apology is not repentance. When you repent, you have to place yourself at the mercy of the person. When you apologize, oh, I'm sorry. That ain't repentance. Repentance, would you please? You're asking for something. Would you forgive me? And it causes you to bow your knee at the person's mercy. And you're asking them to give you back the relationship that we had before the sin occurred. That's what some, that was free. I ain't going to take up an offering for that. See, trust is a decision to be faithful. Trust leads to personal wholeness. You know what I mean by personal wholeness? We are body, soul, and spirit. We should be whole, one. But when you are like a politician, I hope I got some politicians in here, <laughs> who say one thing to the constituency, but believe another, you are fragmented. Are you hearing me? You know why Barack Obama got gray head so fast? Because you have to do that, being a politician. You have to say things for the people that you don't even believe. And when you don't believe what you say, you are in disagreement with yourself. It's called stress. <laughs> That's why I would never be. They asked Billy Graham. He used to go and pray for so many presidents. And they said, would you ever consider running for office? He said, no, I would never step down to that space. <laughs> we have pastor, we have the highest calling in the land. As ministers of the gospel, we are trusted with the sacred document of the king and his kingdom. So we are entrusted with the trust of the people. And I tell TC all the time, I thank you for trusting me. And my decisions are rooted in what I know God has given me, the loyalty of people. That's a gift. And if you think of it in any other way, you're going to miss it and you're going to create something that's going to destroy it. And Satan will blind you to chase something you ain't never going to get anyway. And that was for free. <laughs> Everybody say fragmentation. fragmentation. A house divided against itself can't what? Yeah. This is a house. Amen? Spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless. Look at the text. Look at this text. Read it with me. To the pure, all things are what? But to the defiled and unbelieving, nothing is what? But the, both their minds and their what? Consciences. Soul, spirit. Mind and soul, conscience is in your spirit. Both their mind and their spirit is defiled. That's, a, that's an unsaved person. What the verse is saying is when a person doesn't trust God, 
They really don't trust themselves. And certainly not going to trust somebody else. Their conscience is defiled and unbelieving because it's not pure. It's condemned. And a person that lies thinks everybody's a liar. Oh, hallelujah. Think everybody's a liar. A thief thinks everybody steals. An adulterer thinks everybody cheats. Unto the pure, all things are pure. But unto the defiled and the believer, nothing's pure. Your conscience is defiled and unbelieving because it's not pure. It's condemned. A believer can be in the same unbelieving space, this state where nothing is pure. Especially somebody that's, their trust has been betrayed. The foundation of any relationship is trust. I can't say it enough. Relationships are weakened without trust. So the question is this. Do you have faith in God? In the balcony, do you have faith in God? Here's a better question. Can God have faith in you? Trust is at the root of Stephen's story. Trust was the essence of his faith. And here's a word for you. Here's a word for you. Proverbs 4, 23. Let me end with this. Guard your heart. With all what? Uh Uh-huh. Guard your heart. Because out of your heart, your spirit, flows what? The issues that impact your life. Where is faith? In your heart. Faith is a product of the spirit. So when it says guard your heart, it's saying guard it so you can guard your faith. So that it remains highly operational. Because you want a faith that is highly operational. Close your Bibles. There's so much more I can say, but we ain't got time. I think you got the point. Would you stand to your feet for a moment? I want to pray. And anybody that heard the word today, if you heard the word of God and you know you're relaxed in your faith, I got so many people watching me online right now. Some folks have been watching me online. I don't know if it's, you have the, the same, same issues here that we have in the States. That, and there's some folks at TC I haven't seen in two years since COVID. You probably got some folks right here. Ain't been in this building since COVID. He didn't say where two or three meet online. He said where two or three are what? Yeah. There is something you get from the corporate grace that is present right now that you cannot get online. Thank God we have online. It got us through. It expanded our audience at church. We've even got people out of state now faithful, committed. But that's secondary. That ain't primary. Primary is this. And humans can't be human through technology totally. We need, we are social beings. I need to feel you. There's a guy who wrote a book. He said, you know, I could have interviewed everybody through Zoom. But it cost me to fly around the world and interview these people personally. Because I need to see their body language. I needed to feel their emotion. I need to, that's what humans, that's how we're designed. And I'm not slapping you, but I'm telling you, it's secondary. It ain't primary. This is primary. And there will be nothing that will ever replace it. 
I'm on my way to Vietnam in November to preach and teach underground pastors. You know, some of them people have to find, they, they figure out where they're going to have church that week. They got a faith that communism can't destroy. <laughs> yeah, we're going to leave some folks behind. We know that. But then we got some of us that are just committed. And some of you are in a place where God is willing to stand up and, and commend your faith. Would he stand up for your faith today? Ask yourself that question. Would he stand and, and would that get his attention where you are right now? So I want to pray so that we can demonstrate that which is needed to get his attention because stuff getting ready to get real serious, folks. You hear what I'm saying? I think things are going to get so serious in America that we ain't even going to be able to meet in buildings like this. That's how serious it's going to be. Why? Because the church is the conscience of its society. And they don't want your voice. They want to do what they do without you reminding them that it's sin. And as long as you're around, you're a problem. Are you hearing me? Greatest threat is the church. But guess what? They'll never be able to get rid of the church. I don't care what they do. Of course, it's the Lord's church. That should have got a big praise God. <laughs> it's the Lord's church. In America, he's separating. We have affirming churches and non-affirming churches. Y'all know what I mean? Don't know what I mean? <laughs> In the Bible, we're taught that there's only two genders. Male and female. You know how many the world got now? You can't even count them. So you will either be an affirming church or you will be a non-affirming church. And we're seeing more affirming, we're seeing more churches that are non-affirming becoming affirming. The Methodist church just split millions of people. United Methodist Church, which affirms, has split from the global Methodist Church that's non-affirming. So God is pulling his church out of churches. Y'all hear what I'm saying? That's why a message like this is so relevant because you're going to have to stand. It is getting ready to be no joke in a minute. And all of this glamour that we all caught up with God just showed us he don't need no building. He just showed us who he is. The whole world just, do you know he could have blew on COVID and it could have been gone? But he let it linger. I hope we learn some stuff from, from what we just went through. Don't be like them folks that walk through the ground, through the dry ground with the waters raised and forgot and got on the other side and forgot. Remember who he is and what he just did. He allows us to gather. Thank God we can gather freely. We got a beautiful place where we can gather. But make sure the faith is in your heart. So wherever you meet, Wherever pastor says, this is where we're meeting today, that's the church. Are y'all hearing me? God told me years ago, build truth center so it can go underground. 
if it needs to go underground like that. And that's how I had to build it. So if we got to go underground, we know where we're going to meet. <laughs> we got communication apparatus. We know what we need to do. Because that's where this culture is moving toward. Some of y'all looking at me like I got three heads. <laughs> but I'm speaking so much truth to you right now, you can't even stand it. This is where we are headed, folks. So let me pray for your faith. Father, ha, glory. I pray for the faith of your saints. That they be rooted and grounded without compromise in your word, God. They love you so much, they love you unto death. That's where it has to take us. God, I pray right now that they understand they are possessors of nothing, stewards of everything they have. The only thing they leave this planet with is their soul. Even when time is ready, you will give them a new body. <laughs> Father, have us think on another level this morning. Let's look at Stephen as a model of what we need to do, how we need to prepare ourselves. God, I pray right now that their faith be translated into everyone in this church. And let it be inoculated into their spirit this morning. Faith that is going to move them from faith to faith. And may the glory of God be revealed in this house as never before. As your people come together, Lord God, not move because it's raining outside. Not move because the weather conditions, circumstances, but a faith that can withstand the circumstances. I pray for this house because you called this place. You birthed it, God, and you got a divine plan for it. And I thank you today for the privilege of being able to stand here and share and pray over your people. Now may the words of our mouths and the meditation of our heart be acceptable in your sight. Our Lord, faith, and one baptism among us all. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Come on, let's give God a good praise off.
how many of you are like me? How many of you are like me this morning when he said, let me close with this, and you felt it wasn't the time to close? <laughs> I looked at my and I said, what? Already? Time seems to just fly when he's ministering. Isn't that so? Were you blessed this morning? Okay, God bless you. You may be seated.